today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the science of ultimate human performance, about what is possible for our species, and about what is possible for each of us. So when I was 30 years old, I got Lyme disease. And if you guys don't know what Lyme disease is like, it's sort of like the worst flu you've ever had, crossed with paranoid schizophrenia. And I spent about the better portion of three years in bed. And I was, I was unable to move, I could barely walk across a room, and Lyme gets into your brain and it reduces cognitive function severely. So I was clear-headed and able to work and function about 10% of the time, about an hour a day. And the doctors didn't know if there was anything else they could do for me. They had pulled me off medicine because my stomach lining started bleeding out and there was nothing else they could give me. And after about three years of this, I had decided I was going to kill myself. Not because I'm a particularly depressive person, but because there was nothing anybody could do for me. And from that point on, all I was going to be was a burden to my friends and my family. And in the middle of kind of all these dark thoughts, a friend of mine showed up at my doorstep and demanded that we go surfing. It was a fairly ridiculous request. I couldn't walk across the room, and it had been about five years since I'd been surfing. And the last time I had gone surfing, I nearly drowned in a big wave accident. I had no desire ever to get back to the ocean. My friend kind of badgered me and badgered me and badgered me and was a pain in my ass. And after about three hours of this, I was like, what the hell? Let's go surfing today. What is the worst that can happen? I can always kill myself tomorrow. <laughs> so they kind of walked me to the car, literally, and they drove me to Sunset Beach in Los Angeles, which if you know anything about surfing in Los Angeles, it is the wimpiest beginner wave in the world. And the tide was out and the waves were really tiny and there was no one out there. And they gave me a board the size of a Cadillac and the bigger the board, the easier it is to surf, and it was gigantic, and they kind of walked me, grabbed my elbows, and literally walked me out to the line and put me on this board. And I was out there about 30 seconds when a wave came. And I don't know exactly what happened, muscle memory took over, whatever, but I spun my board around, and I paddled twice, and I popped to my feet, and I popped up into a totally different dimension. My senses were incredibly, incredibly heightened. I felt like I had panoramic vision, like I could see out of the back of my head. Time had slowed to an absolute crawl, so that matrix time, that was what was going on. And the strangest part about the whole thing is I felt great. I mean, I felt better than I had felt in years. I felt alive, I felt that thrum of possibility, and it felt amazing. It felt so good, and I caught four more waves that day. And by the fifth wave, I was disassembled. They drove me home, they put me into bed. People actually had to bring me food for 14 days because I couldn't walk to my kitchen to make a meal. But on the 15th day, which was the day I could move again, I sort of hitchhiked back to the beach, and I did it again. And I had, a, once again, this really bizarre, strange, altered state of consciousness, a bunch of waves, and et cetera, et cetera, and went back home. And over the course of about six months, when the only thing I was doing different in my life was surfing, I went from about 10% functionality up to about 80% functionality. My first question was, what the hell is going on, right? Surfing is not a known cure for chronic autoimmune conditions. <laughs> Worse, I'm trained as a science writer. I'm a rational materialist. I don't have quasi-mystical experiences, and I certainly don't have them while I'm surfing. Lyme is only fatal if it gets into your brain. So I was absolutely certain that the experiences I were having were the result of the Lyme being in my brain, and it was proof that I was dying. So I lit out on a giant quest to figure out what the heck was going on with me. And what I discovered is these strange states that I had been experiencing while I was out in the wave have a name. They're called flow states. Now, some of, them, some of us call them runner's high, being in the zone, being unconscious if you happen to be a basketball player. If you're a beatnik jazz musician, you were in the pocket. Over the years, they've had dozens of different names. Flow is the name scientists prefer. Flow is technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness. This is a state of consciousness where we feel our best and we perform our best. And I think most of us have at least a passing experience with flow. These are those moments of total absorption. We get so focused on what you're doing that everything else disappears. Action and awareness merge. Sense of time dilates. That means sometimes it slows down, like the experience I had while I was surfing. Sometimes it speeds up and five hours will pass by in like five minutes. A sense of self disappears, self-consciousness goes along with it. And throughout, all aspects of performance, mental and physical, go through the roof. So researchers now believe that flow states underpin most of our gold medals and world championships. 
So when I said performance goes through the roof, I wasn't kidding. They believe it accounts for major scientific breakthroughs, significant progress in the arts. In business, McKinsey did a 10-year study. They found top executives in flow are five times more productive than out of flow. Five times more productive is 500% more productive. It means you could go to work on Monday, spend Monday in flow, take Tuesday through Friday off, and get as much done as your steady state peers. So that may seem a little extreme. I want to give you a concrete example of what flow makes possible. Arguably the best flow hackers on earth, for reasons that I'll get to in a second, are action and adventure sport athletes. These people are better at reproducing the state of flow than pretty much anybody in the history of the world. As a result, over the past 25 years, in surfing, skiing, rock climbing, mountain biking, et cetera, et cetera, there has been nearly exponential growth in ultimate human performance. That's performance when life or limb is on the line. Nothing like this has ever happened before in the history of the world. Progress, sports progression is slow, it's steady, it's governed by the laws of evolution. At no point in history does it quintuple in a decade. That's exactly what's been going on in action and adventure sports. I'll give you two quick examples. Surfing is a thousand year old sport. From 400 AD until 1996, the biggest wave anybody had ever surfed was 25 feet. Above that, everybody, scientists, surfers, physicists, whatnot, believed it was absolutely impossible. Today, surfers are pushing into waves that are 100 feet tall. Snowboarding, which is what you're looking at, in 1992, the biggest gap jump anybody had ever cleared on a snowboard was 40 feet. Now, 40 feet is huge, right? It's two buses stacked end to end. Today, as you can see from the photo, guys are jumping over 250 feet. This is what flow makes possible. So I want to talk a little bit about why that is, because there's some really, really, really good news here. Earlier, we talked about Chick Set Me High in the introduction. Thank you for that. So Chick Set Me High represents kind of the psychology of flow. And we have about 150 years of psychological research into flow. But in the past 25 years, we have neurobiological research into flow. We are starting to understand what goes on in the brain during these states. We are pulling back the veil on ultimate human performance. So the old idea, and most of you in this room have probably heard of it, it's now called the 10% brain myth. The old idea about ultimate performance is that God, we only use 10% of our brain, so ultimate performance or flow must be the full brain firing on all cylinders. Turns out that's not the case at all. In fact, exact opposite. Flow is, one of the causes of flow is known as transient hypofrontality. Transient meaning temporary, hypo, H-Y-P-O, is the opposite of hyper, it means to slow down, to deactivate. Frontality is the prefrontal cortex, which Dave Asprey talked about. It's the part of your brain that houses most of your higher cognitive functions, your sense of will, your sense of morality, your complex decision making. In flow, this part of the brain is actually shutting off. It's not working, it's not functioning. So why does time pass so strangely in a flow state? because time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. And as parts of it wink out, we can no longer separate past from present from future. Your sense of self is also produced in your prefrontal cortex. So as it starts to wink out, your inner critic, among other structures, goes away. So that nagging, defeatist, always on voice in your head, that voice of doubt, shut off completely in flow. The result of this, when this happens, is tremendous liberation. We feel this as freedom, risk-taking goes through the roof, creativity goes through the roof. Let me give you an example of how much creativity is accelerated. In a recent study in Australia, they took 40 people, they gave them a very, very tricky brain teaser to solve, something that needs incredibly creative problem-solving skills, nobody could solve the brain teaser. Then they used transcranial magnetic stimulation and sent a, basically a magnetic pulse to the prefrontal cortex, knocked it out. 23 people then solved the problem in record time. In my organization, the Flow Genome Project, we've done preliminary studies on creativity as well. We find people report a 700% boost in creativity. This is what happens when the prefrontal cortex goes away. It's not just transient hypofrontality that's producing flow. There's also a profound neurochemical dump. We get five of the most potent neurochemicals the brain can produce during flow. Now, all of these are performance-enhancing chemicals, but they're also feel-good neurochemicals. These are basically the most addictive drugs on Earth, and flow is the only time you get five of them at once, which means flow is essentially the most addictive state on Earth. 
Now, psychologists, they don't like the word addictive, so instead they use autotelic. When something is autotelic, it's an end in itself. We've all seen this in action. When the coders stay up three days straight on cold pizza and warm beer to finish a project, it is not the food and the drink that is keeping them going. It is the flow that is keeping them going. One of the other things that happens in flow, one of the other things these neurochemicals do, actually a quick shorthand for learning and memory, is the more neurochemicals that show up during an experience, the greater chance that experience will move from short-term holding into long-term storage. Neurochemicals are essentially big neon signs that say important, save for later. So flow, as a very potent brain dump of these five neurochemicals, massively jacks up learning and memory. And studies run by the US military on snipers, along with a team at Advanced Brain Monitoring in Carlsbad, California, found snipers in flow, marksmen in flow, learn 230 to 500 percent faster. So Malcolm Gladwell's famous 10,000 hours to mastery, the research shows that flow will cut it in half. So there's even better news here, and I'm not going to go into it now in the breakout session. You can come listen and I'll talk about it. We now know, because we have this neuroscience and we have the action sport athletes, what the action sport athletes gave us was a hard data set with which to work. Before, we, it was really tricky to study flow, because how could you tell if somebody's in flow or out of flow, right? Action sport athletes, we knew they were in flow. Using the neuroscience and the action sports athletes together, we have discovered there are 17 triggers that bring on flow. These are preconditions that bring on more of the state. What did action and adventure sport athletes do to hack flow so successfully? They packed their lives with these flow triggers. Now, really quickly, I skipped it earlier, so I wanted to tell you what happened to my health. These five neurochemicals, they also jack up the immune system and reset the nervous system. Autoimmune condition is essentially a nervous system gone haywire, so by calming my nervous system down and pushing up my immune system, these flow states gave my body a chance to heal. But I want to close with a different and more important idea. What's interesting is that 500% increase in work, what's going on in action and adventure sports, all of this is the very beginning. Our knowledge of these triggers is a couple of years old. Our knowledge of the neurobiology is less than 20 years old. In other words, these massive exaggerations in performance that I'm talking about, this is only the front end of what's possible. We really, honestly, have no idea what is possible for our species. We have no idea where our limits lie. So thank you very much.